want to welcome all of you to the annual meeting for Healthcare for All North Carolina. It's exciting to see all of you here, um, and we hope that you can enjoy um, the speakers that we have today. We're very grateful um, that Dr. Uma Tadapelli and Melinda St. Louis are here to speak with us today, and then we also really hope to offer a lot of space for all of you that have joined us to spend time together um, and learn from each other and share your ideas and desires for um, involvement in the Medicare for All movement and in the single payer movement. So we really appreciate your time here with us today. Um, my name is Hannah Potter. I'm the president of Healthcare for All North Carolina. Healthcare for All North Carolina is a chapter of PNHP, which is Physicians for a National Health Program. And our organization um, is the Healthcare for All North Carolina, but we represent mostly the Triangle, Triad, and Eastern part of the state. There are other two other PNHP PNHP chapters in North Carolina, one in Charlotte, Healthcare Justice, and then one out in Asheville, Healthcare for All, Western North Carolina. Um, and our organization works towards achieving a single payer system that offers guaranteed universal quality healthcare for everyone um, in our country. So we really welcome all of you into our work in any way that is feasible for you. Um, there's lots of different opportunities. You'll learn some more about the work we're currently doing, the work of some of our partners and um, collaborators. Um, and we also wanna hear from you about ideas for what and how you wanna contribute to the, to the movement. So again, welcome everyone. Um, please feel free to introduce yourselves in your in the chat, um, share your name, share where you're at, um, how you're feeling, what brought you here today. Um, and we really hope that this can be a interactive space um, and as we continue to build community around this movement. So I will pass it on to Will um, as he is going to do a special presentation for us to start us off. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, well, I think we're real fortunate to have some nurses from uh, Mission Hospital, as well as all the uh, members and guests on the, the program today for the annual meeting. But um, one reason I know we have the, the, some of the nurses on is because we had a, a recent death of um, uh, a really active um, healthcare activist um, advocate and a, a a real um, advocate for all our coworkers in our community. So we're excited to announce the creation of a, an annual uh, Maggie Nelson Courage and Justice Award. Maggie died just um, a couple weeks ago and Maggie was, she was a beloved coworker. She was a registered nurse at um, Copestone Mission Hospital up in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and she was also a political activist and she was an instrumental leader in the, um, in the historic union victory in 2020 at Mission Hospital. Um, and although Maggie was, um, you know, she was petite in physical stature, um, she had mighty determination and she was courageous, compassionate and was a relentless advocate for her coworkers, um, community and her patients. Um, and as a frontline caregiver, she believed that all the healthcare um, system should be universal and it should be centered on the needs of every person. And she saw firsthand as a um, healthcare worker, the need for Medicare for all and a union. And she believed by joining together, all things are possible. Um, and um, so this word will be presented in the spirit of connecting us all in this common struggle for healthcare justice. And I know that some of the nurses here may wanna say a few words um, about Maggie. I know we all have special, special things that, memory, that we remember about Maggie and uh, she was a special person. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will. Um, I'm Kim well. Anderson and I wanted to share some, I just wrote a little thing to, to share about Maggie that I wanted to read. Um, my friends and I first wanna thank you 
and the board, thank Will and the board for this opportunity. I knew Maggie Nelson for 11 years and we really grew close over the last six years. Uh, Maggie believed in fairness and justice. She believed in universal health care and Medicaid for all, Medicare for all, excuse me. She used to attend Moral Mondays with Reverend Barber. Some of you may know, Rev, you know, know about that when that was going on and she did that here in Asheville. Politics were important to her and she followed them closely. One of her heroes was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, she would call senators and, and congressmen she did. <laughs> to go on record with, with subjects important to her and she encouraged others to do the same. Um, and that's when I started calling. Maggie attended the Women's March in Washington, D.C., the first march in 2017. Uh, she was a leader that worked hard to get support for the union at Mission and to ensure the historic votes passed. She was also involved in NNU uh, union efforts as a nurse in California in the 90s. And this award carrying Maggie's name is an honor and most fitting legacy for her. And um, Maggie's friends and family, thank you guys. And it's still, it's still raw. She um, passed away April 11th. And I've been up all night working, <laughs> so I'm pretty emotional. Thanks so much, Kim. I don't know if anybody else wants. Yeah. Well, I slept all night, and I'm pretty emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I love her very much. Yeah. Maggie was well known to all of us. Everybody remembers her for her wit, and I, that's the first thing that drew me to her. I've known her 20 years. We worked on another floor together for seven or eight years, and we've been on Cookstone. I brought her to Cookstone 13 years ago. And she loved it. She um, wanted to retire and then she couldn't. She just wouldn't do it. She's got too much to do. So Maggie will be in our hearts forever. And with this beautiful honor today, we thank you because it so fits her. And, and it, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Maggie was so special to us. She will be forever. Absolutely. I never would have thought of becoming an activist without her. You know, I've always I've always supported, you know, um, more le liberal leaning causes, but I've never actually gone out and decided to fight for them. And because of her, she put that fire inside of my gut to actually get out and pound the pavement for greater justice. And I'm forever in her debt for that. <laughs> Thank you, Will, for having us. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'll hear from us again. <laughs> oh, I know. I know we will. These, this crew, are, they're, they're really yeah. strong fighters, and uh, their courage has been amazing through the union program. And I will say with Maggie, that's how really I think I came to know all of you all. was um, It was through the, the union struggle, but also Maggie was the one who introduced. And every time, as you all know, I said, Maggie, we've got to get to this floor. We have somebody we haven't identified yet, and we need to. We need to do that. Maggie was there and even in other parts of the hospital. And I know one time Maggie went to a unit where you all, that's not where you all practice. And uh, Maggie brought cookies um, to that unit. Mm -hmm. that's <laughs> and, right. um, Maggie was amazing and a, and a great sense of humor. And um, yeah, yeah, it, she will be missed. But I'm glad we can do this. And I, one thing I didn't mention, um, when I was just introducing the, the Maggie Nelson Courage and Justice Award is that we'll do it, it will be an annual award and it will be um, done right before that Moral Monday thing that we've talked about before, you know, that grew out of the HK on J March that I think at different points we've had tens of thousands, maybe 60,000 people down there in Raleigh, which some of the people on the call are probably familiar with, but um, there's a breakfast that takes place before that annual march, and that's when we'll present the award uh, to a, you know, to a fitting, uh, deserving health advocate activist. So, um, thank you. anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Will, and thank you to all of you for speaking about your memories of Maggie and for being here with us today. We really appreciate that. I'm going to pass it on to Jonathan for our next presentation. Hey, thank you guys for coming on and taking the time. I know what it's like to work um, a 12-hour shift, and I'm sure you're all very tired, so that's very, very nice of you. 
to give your time and your, your energy. Um, so I'm going to be introducing the uh, actual panel discussion portion of our meeting. And I have a short PowerPoint to present. Let me share screen really quick. And I think it will be very fitting uh, since we've just had these really uh, powerful words from the nurses um, who were workers in North Carolina who made a real uh, historic stand this past year um, for their patients and the health of their community. Um, so our theme for today's panel discussion is essential work mobilizing to win Medicare for all. And uh, the past year has been marked by overwhelming suffering from the effects of white supremacy, racial health inequities, police and state sanctioned violence, and a profit driven healthcare system that contributed to, de to the deaths of nearly 600,000 Americans from COVID-19. But despite the pain, there were tremendous acts of resistance and calls for solidarity. The multiracial movement galvanized by the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police was the largest in American history with between 15 and 26 million participants, including rural communities that have not witnessed this level of public protest since the height of the civil rights movement or earlier. 2020 clearly was also the year that workers claim their essential status. Essential workers are people whose labor is necessary to ensure the continuity of critical functions. They are Amazon shippers, grocery store clerks, prisoners and meat packers. And while the, um, and while the corporate class used the monitor to enrich themselves by tying vulnerable workers, particularly low wage black and brown workers, to the assembly line, that did not stop thousands of people from claiming their essential status and using their newfound public attention to speak out and demand change. Uh, perhaps the most visible were frontline healthcare workers. In California's East Bay, more than 3,000 hospital workers went on a five day strike that forced major concessions from their employer. Frontline healthcare workers uh, outside Mount Sinai Hospital in New York also demanded more personal protective equipment. And here in North Carolina, nurses at Mission Health Hospital scored the largest labor victory at a young union hospital in the South since 1975, having gone up against the country's most powerful hospital corporation. The need for a universal single payer healthcare system has never been more urgent. It is unquestionably the fight of our lives. Many of us are at this meeting today because we believe that our single payer activism is important. I would argue that what we do is not just important, but essential work too. Um, we are very fortunate to have two speakers with us today. One is going to speak on policy, including the recently introduced Medicare for All Act in the House. The other is a physician who has firsthand experience for the need for a single payer system and the necessity to build a worker led movement around it. I think we can go to Will now, who is going to introduce our first speaker. Sorry, I think I was on mute. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I think it's um, we all are aware that our that our current system is um, defiled by uh, profit incentives and uh, corporate interests, and uh, we know that there's some mighty. Um, large obstacles we're going to have to overcome if we if we want one that's based around the needs of patients um, and if we want a, a universal single payer um, public good health care system. I think it's that in that spirit that I, I'm really um, pleased um, that we have an opportunity to hear from Uma Tadapali. Dr. Tadapali is a um, geriatrician based in Durham, North Carolina. And she's a longtime member of uh, PNHP, Physicians for a National Health Program. Um, she saw the need for a multi-issue political home for healthcare workers on the left. And she and fellow PNHP member, Dr. Scott Goldberg, um, co-founded Doctors for Bernie in November, 2019. Later, uh, Dr. Tadapelli, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, um, the group joined with the Democratic Socialists of America Health Workers Collective 
whose mission is to organize workers in healthcare, regardless of discipline, um, around the struggle for a health system that values workers and patients over profit. So uh, let's all give a warm welcome to Dr. Tadapali. Thanks so much, Will. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, so yeah, I am. Um, I'm a geriatric and palliative medicine physician. So I care for adults with serious illness and adults with disabilities who need long term care. And in my experience trying to serve basic human needs in a system driven by profit, I've seen firsthand how this system kicks people when they're down. Um, I, I probably don't have to tell you all how normal it is, unfortunately, for our healthcare system to impoverish people in order to get the care that they need. Um, and I wish I didn't have to tell you how normal it is for, for me to see people in the hospital and the ICU because they can't afford their medications or their co-pays and deductibles for services that they need to take care of themselves. Because our system ties health insurance to employment, millions of workers have lost their healthcare in the middle of a pandemic. Even before this crisis, nearly one in three Americans were uninsured or underinsured with lousy insurance leaving them struggling to pay for care when they needed it. Now the situation is much worse. Communities hit hardest by the coronavirus largely do not have health insurance coverage at all. So I'm using this word un underinsured, which you may be familiar with, but just, just in case, you know, what does that mean? It means lousy insurance that doesn't cover us fully. So half of us in this country get our insurance from our employer through the private insurance companies. And most of that insurance is lousy. Um, providers like me are starting to use the term financial toxicity, referring to the impossible choices our patients face if they come down with a serious illness. A choice between prioritizing their treatment and going bankrupt or dying prematurely from inability to afford treatment or stabilizing personal care or long-term care services. Let's talk about cost for a second. Um, $3.9 trillion is the figure that's quoted. It's double what other wealthy nations pay for a system that leaves many people broke or prematurely dead. Why does this lousy system cost so much? If we break down cost into services rendered times prices, so services rendered times prices, that means, uh, and I tell you that the studies show that we don't use any more services than other wealthy nations, that means that the problem is the prices. The prices are too high. And why are the prices high? Well, it's because of the racket between hospitals who set the prices and private insurance companies who agree to them, who agree to those prices because they're paying for them with your paycheck through your employer. As costs have risen in the past 20 years, workers' contributions through payroll deduction have increased by more than double, by 242%. And this is actually a primary reason for wage stagnation in this country. Employers are transferring the increasing cost of healthcare to their workers, and this trend will only continue. Working people pay, working people and the poor pay disproportionately more into our health system than the rich do. So the way we're doing this is like a regressive tax. Our health system is extracting wealth from workers to pay for executive salaries and administrative waste, kind of a bloated corporate bureaucracy. In a way, our health system is reproducing inequality by facilitating an upward redistribution of wealth. Insurance and drug companies are making record profits by taking bigger and bigger cuts out of our paychecks. The point is, we are already paying for Medicare for all, we're just not getting it. 2020 has made clear the enormous value of the labor of essential workers who keep our communities going. We know that the labor of health workers who have cared for our families this year has enormous value. Ultimately, C-suites of hospitals are extracting the true value of that care worker labor in the form of their handsome salaries 
and excess revenue that gets put into a trust so that the hospital can acquire more hospitals, clinics, and buildings, and eventually become a monopoly. Meanwhile, those hospitals have been exploiting their workers' time and energy to the edge. And some workers have paid the ultimate price of their life, dying from COVID or from chronic illnesses, from toxic stress of that work environment. When one person is assigned too many patients, we do our best, but we're only human. And there is a breaking point where patient care suffers. Families don't get the communication and education that they need. I want to shout out to the nurses at St. Vincent's Hospital in Massachusetts, a hospital owned by Tenet Healthcare, which is a large for-profit hospital corporation who've been on strike since March 8th um, with a central demand for safe staffing ratios to keep their sa patients safe. The American Hospital Association is one of the main players in the Affordable Coverage Coalition or the coalition to stop Medicare for all. Why do you think hospitals are involved? Because Medicare for all would eliminate the racket that allows hospitals to set such high prices. Increasingly, hospitals are being acquired by, pri by private equity, which means those hospitals are ultimately accountable to shareholders on the stock market. So make no mistake, Medicare for all is an enormous threat to capital and to the bosses of healthcare industry. The counterpoint to those bosses are the workers whose labor their profits depend on. Winning Medicare for all will require a powerful labor movement that can pose a credible threat to collectively withhold labor in key sectors, forcing the C-level executives of healthcare industry to concede. In this vein, I have joined the Democratic Socialists of America's Health Workers Collective, a sectoral organizing network supporting early worker self-organization on the job. Because a powerful labor movement will be essential to winning transformative reforms like Medicare for All, the Democratic Socialists of America's highest priority right now is our national campaign to pass the PRO Act, the Protect the Right to Organize Act. The PRO Act will transform workers' rights by dismantling decades of crushing anti-union laws that are a legacy of Jim Crow, laws that allow employers to intimidate and fire black, brown, and white workers trying to organize together for their collective safety. The PRO Act will make it easier to unionize and will strengthen collective bargaining rights, granting workers more structural power, health, and safety on the job. In the past month, our campaign has made over half a million calls to connect constituents in key states directly to their senators, inundating those senators' offices with the message to pass the PRO Act. And it's working. We've actually already flipped two of our five sen target senators to co-sponsor the PRO Act, um, Senator Angus King in Maine, and just last week we flipped Joe Manchin in West Virginia. After this unprecedented year, we need to pay workers back with both Medicare for All and with fast-tracked unions to protect their health and safety on the job. Are we gonna let the bosses organize our society around racist abandonment, policing, ecological extraction, and working us sometimes to death? Or are you and I and everyone on this call going to organize it around solidarity and care for each other, around safe jobs and saving lives? Nothing will change without you taking collective action in organizations. So I ask you as people serious, winning about Medi serious about winning Medicare for all to struggle with the labor movement, to support the labor movement and the campaign to, pa to pass the PRO Act. You can volunteer to phone bank constituents in the remaining target states of Virginia and Arizona at, um, at I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat, but it's bit.ly slash PRO Act phone bank or you can donate at another link I'll drop in the chat. And if you're a health worker, you can keep this conversation by, by joining DSA's Health Workers Collective. I'll drop all of the links in the chat. Um, thank you so much for having me and I'm happy to answer questions whenever the Q&A is. Thank you, Uma. Um, I think that we will have a little bit of time for question and answer questions right now. Um, so I think Jonathan Michaels, would you like to start us off with some questions and then we can open it up to anyone on the floor if you'd have like to have some questions as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I should say, uh, full disclosure, I'm an interim steering committee on the DSA Health Workers Collective as well. But uh, Dr. Tadapelli, I was interested in kind of hearing more about your personal journey um, 
towards coming to this conclusion that we really need to put workers at the forefront of the movement if we hope to make uh, a credible challenge to uh, the profit-driven healthcare system. When did that uh, belief kind of come to you? And I know that you've done a lot of reading over the last several years, um, but maybe this is something you've always thought, um, but you just didn't see uh, an organization that was multi-issue uh, specifically for healthcare workers on the left. Um, and then now was the right time to, to start it. But I'm just interested in hearing your personal story uh, coming to this cause. Yeah, um, well, I learned about Medicare for All when I was in medical school. And um, I, at the time it seemed like such a no brainer intellectually. Um, and the way it was framed to me was that the reason why it's not happening is because people just think it's politically infeasible. It wasn't even part of the Overton window really of discourse at that time. That was when um, healthcare reform was being framed around you know, the Affordable Care Act and expansion of private insurance. Um, but later on, when you know, after Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016, that started to actually open up people's imaginations of what was possible um, and Medicare for all being one of them. Um, I got re-energized in the movement and just in my reading, you know, learned a lot about just how extractive our healthcare system is. And the, the basically the position that workers are in, um, in basically, all, in, in terms of the power balance that ultimately is occurring in, in our healthcare system. So um, what I mean by that is that when I started to learn about how a lot of, a few people have a ton to lose by shifting to Medicare for all, like that this isn't just about convincing people about how this makes sense. This is just what makes sense. Like it's literally our system is not sustainable the way that it is right now. Um, it's, that's not enough that like, unfortunately this really is sort of a, a battle over power. It made, me, it made me think more about historically what did it take to win universal reforms. And it made me look at sort of the New Deal era and what was happening in sort of the kind of social movement ecology at that time to allow for social security to actually happen. Um, and there is a lot, you know, I'm not a historian, but, you know, just in my study of this, go, general strikes were a really big part of demanding concessions from essentially the, the, the bosses, the ruling class. And one of those concessions was social security and the new deal. And ultimately I think given how much of a threat to capital Medicare for all poses, it's going to require ultimately the power of workers, which comes down to sort of the value of our labor and the fact that if we take action in unison and synchronized and withhold our labor, <laughs> nothing will work, <laughs> right? Like that will bring the ruling class to its knees and force them to give us things that we need. Um, so that's sort of where I, that's how I landed at sort of that, at labor as being really an, a, an essential component of the milieu that will be required to win Medicare for all. And I mean, as we're seeing with Biden coming in and sort of having a much more impressive domestic offerings than um, maybe we would have anticipated given his prior record, I don't think that's in, I don't, I mean, I think that's in no small part related to the amount of activism and organizing that's happened in the last three or four years, right? Is that we've created the conditions for him to kind of be like an FDR type of person? Not quite, but um, but yeah, it's no coincidence. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, thank you. 
Thank you, Uma. There's a few questions in the chat around um, how you chose the senators that you're targeting and a related question that you maybe can answer at the same time is um, if there's Republicans in certain, certain states targeted too and how you can imagine a, a win in the Senate without getting rid of the filibuster. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not like a political wizard and by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm actually, I'm not really on the inner circle of the PRO Act campaign at CSA, but um, the reason basically CSA is working in coalition with the unions, um, like a national pass the PRO Act campaign that's being driven by the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades or IUPAT. And um, kind of together, the choice of targets was initially um, was, was focused on it, the corporate Democrats who hadn't signed on yet. The majority of Democrats in the Senate had already signed on, and there were only a handful who hadn't. And so we wanted to make sure that ultimately this is also like an educational campaign uh, highlighting and making it painful for that for these senators to to force them to show us which side they're on, right? The side of corporations or the workers, um, and you know that was the reason for just at least getting the Democrats first. But there is talk, I think, now of beginning to target some Republican senators. Which ones? I'm not sure. I will say that in the House there were some Republicans and Republican um, House representatives that did sign on to the PRO Act bill. So, um, you know, stay tuned, we'll see. Um, but we're starting with those target, target senators first. Uh, in terms of the filibuster, I mean, that's a lot, that's a kind of a wonkier question that I'm personally, I don't feel I have much authority to talk about, but um, I hope what I was saying earlier was helpful. I mean, especially just in terms of the political illumination of which side are you on and, and framing the campaign around that. Yeah, I think that was very helpful framing. I'm gonna give one more question for you, Uma, before we move on um, to our next speaker and then maybe towards the end, there may be more time for general wider discussion. But as you were talking about um, the need to include obviously workers at the center of this movement. Could you speak to any experience that you are a part of or you know of about how we are connecting to other movements that include undocumented workers who pay into the system but are often excluded from any benefits? Yeah, I mean, I actually will bring it back to the PRO Act, actually. I mean, there's a lot of workers of color, be they immigrants, black, brown, you know, in construction and all in low wage hospital workers, healthcare workers, nursing home workers who could all stand to benefit from the dismantling of the crushing anti-union laws that have, have existed. And um, I think, you know, there's a, uh, yeah, I mean, I just think that people are being exploited in such an, um, just such an unopposed way right now, because we don't have the structural, the tools to actually harness our collective power on the job. Um, and that is something that impacts, you know, it, immigrants as well. So um, I'm not sure if that's a satisfying answer, but I, I would say that like things that focus on the workplace, almost everyone has a boss and um, uh, most people have a boss and especially people who are belong to communities of color. Um, most of our problems that we talk about disproportionately impact them and by giving, essentially unions are the institution of power for the working class um, and they require that people organize together on the job, you know, no matter their race. Um, for equality, for equal protections and equal benefits, wages, um, because they're all part of that same contract. And so in a big way, I think of 
making it easier to unionize and increasing unions as flawed as an institution as they are, as flawed as the Democratic Party institution is, as flawed as all of these institutions are, it is an essential institution for granting equality to people materially on the job in their workplace. Thank you. And I also just to reiterate, um, kind of alluding to the person's question in the chat, I think that we do need to connect our movement to workers that are undocumented as well. And Medicare for all can be a policy that is available to every resident of the United States, regardless of documents. So I think that's important to highlight in our in our work and in our um, collaboration with other groups. Um, Uma, there was another question in the chat and Lauren, I see your question in the chat and we're gonna direct that to Melinda at the end around rural hospitals and perhaps Uma can um, also contribute as well if she'd like. Um, but I would like to just thank you again for um, taking the time to speak with us today and for all that you, the work that you're doing um, in the healthcare system and in your organizing um, and with the PROACT organizing as well. We really appreciate that and really appreciate you sharing those experiences with us today. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it to Rebecca to give an introduction to our next speaker. Thank you, Hannah. Hello everyone, I'm Rebecca Cerise. I'm an at-large member of Healthcare for All North Carolina and a very proud founding member of the North Carolina Medicare for All Coalition, which we'll be hearing about in the next hour. Um, and I'm really excited to um, introduce Melinda. Melinda St. Louis is the Director of Public C Citizens Medicare for All campaign. For the past 20 years, Melinda has led multiple campaigns that challenge corporate power and promote economic justice and human rights, including fighting big pharma greed and global trade agreements. She is now thrilled to focus her energy on building a movement to finally deliver guaranteed sorry, uh, guaranteed health care for everyone in the United States. She received her master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University. Uh, thanks thanks for coming, Melinda. It's all you. Thank you. Hi everyone. It's great to um, to be here, if folks can see my screen. Is the screen share working? Great. Um, so, uh, so thanks again to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I love working with all of you in North Carolina. So really excited to be here. Um, so I, you know, Jonathan and Rebecca had asked me to share uh, some just details about uh, the Medicare for All Act of 2021 that was recently uh, reintroduced and talk a little bit about kind of what our, you know, what this national strategy is to kind of move this legislation forward um, during this Congress. So really excited um, to talk to you all about that. So in the middle of last month, um, representatives Pramila Jayapal and representative Deggie, Debbie Dingle from, um, uh, from Michigan uh, introduced uh, HR 1976 is our new bill number of uh, the Medicare for All Act of 2021. Um, and um, we are expecting uh, the Sen Senator Sanders to introduce um, a Senate version of this uh, legislation in the coming weeks. We can talk a little bit more about kind of the strategy around, um, around the the Senate, but um, I'm going to focus mostly on the House because that has been uh, reintroduced. So I think everyone here probably has a pretty good grasp of what we're talking about when we're talking about um, Medicare for all, but just to be, uh, just, just to quickly lay the groundwork, I mean, what the Medicare for all act of 2021 would do is would improve, importantly improve current Medicare uh, for current enrollees, um, and it would expand it then to everyone living in the United States for their entire lives. So it would mean that we would provide comprehensive benefits. So that includes dental, vision, hearing, which is not currently included in Medicare. It would include long-term care, which is not currently included in Medicare. And then it would include all other medically necessary care um, from doctor's visits to hospital visits, including all reproductive services um, and would allow for freedom of choice of doctors and hospitals, unlike what currently exists in our current system. And it would eliminate all 
uh, all fees, all out-of-pocket costs at the point of service. So that there would be no premiums, no co-pays and no deductibles as, um, and as, um, uh, as, as was said before. And kind of, you know, how it would do that, I mean, this would create a single payer system like similar to what exists in Canada. Um, it's vastly simplifying our healthcare system. Um, and it would prevent providers, hospitals and doctors from using payments from the program for profit and for marketing. So this would go a long way in addressing a lot of the, uh, the out of control costs that, um, that the previous speaker was talking about. And it would provide global budgeting to all hospitals and institutional providers. So that means that um, instead of um, having a fee for every every sonogram, every NR, MRI that, that happens in a hospital, they would, the hospital would receive a budget according to the need of the community, and then that they would be able to provide those services um, to the community. And importantly, it would address the out of outrageous costs by allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices uh, with pharmaceutical companies and would authorize Medicare to actually issue compulsory licenses um, to, for drugs to allow generic competition if a brand name pharmaceutical company refused to negotiate the price down. So it would um, save hundreds of billions of dollars um, through just um, negotiating drug prices. So um, the, uh, there have been a few important tweaks uh, to this legislation. It's very, very similar. It's basically the same bill as what many of us have, have been working on for um, in decades in many ways and definitely in the last Congress. But there were some important um, improvements, which I'm, I'm excited about in this bill. Um, it uh, specified some of the benefits, just made it more explicit um, that were are important, including hospice care and including harm reduction strategies for um, for drug use and took out the word abuse and talked about um, actually um, using harm reduction um, strategies. Um, it specifies now for specifically that the Secretary of Health and Human Services may only improve the benefits package. They cannot remove any benefits that are passed under the original package. So it doesn't give power to you know, a, a, a Republican administration down the road to, to undermine what is passed in uh, Medicare for All. So that's uh, really important. Um, it uh, further expands the benefits uh, to, ex to affected workers uh, in the insurance, private insurance industry and the just transition provision. So that means that, you know, really strengthening and making sure that we're not leaving workers behind that currently work in our private insurance system. Um, and it, um, due to some um, advocacy by, uh, by disability rights communities and those who work uh, in the context of long-term services and supports, um, they have removed home health agencies from the list of providers that are paid global budgets, so they will continue to have a fee-for-service um, arrangement, and that was seen as important for to support um, home, home health workers and to um, support uh, the, the ability for long-term services and support to be uh, provided in the home. And what I think is really, really critical is that it establishes now an office of health equity, recognizing that, um, you know, in the reckoning that our country has had over the past year on racial justice issues that um, obviously uh, getting rid of um, uninsurance and providing insurance to all people would would disproportionately affect those communities of color who have been disproportionately um, uh, uninsured and underinsured, but that that doesn't go far enough. We actually have to go directly and, and address racism in our healthcare system. And um, so this Office of Health Equity would, uh, would require publicly available data on, um, on uh, racial health equity issues, public reporting, and would have direct recommendations on addressing various elements of um, racial health equity in our system. And the Office of Primary Care would be consolidated underneath that um, Office of Health Equity, which I think is really important. Um, and then finally, um, there, there were some there were some concerns around Tricare and Tricare's direct care system would continue to function um, uh, um, separate from Medicare for All, but those who pr 
who receive care under TRICARE would also have the option of, of receiving their care under Medicare for All. So it's similar to um, the uh, Indian Health Services and the veterans and, and the VA, those would continue to operate and they would, um, but people who would have basically have the choice between the Medicare for All system and those current um, systems. So those are some of just a few uh, tweaks, but in terms of like the benefits and the package, it is um, stronger than ever. And we're really excited about it. Um, just to, just to um, kind of take on head on, you know, some of the, some of the myths and misinformation that spread about Medicare for All, what is really important to, that we feel is important to highlight always is that Medicare for All would vastly increase choice for patients, as I mentioned before. No more in-network, no more out-of-network doctors or hospitals. So people love their doctors. They, you rarely hear about anyone saying that they love United Healthcare or they love Blue Cross. They, they love their doctors. Um, and, and so it's important that you would have free choice of doctors and hospitals, much more so than current and you would have a portability of care. So if you move, if you change, you know, if you change your job, if you lose your job, if you, um, if your employer uh, decides to have a different plan, none of that would be an issue anymore. You would have stable coverage that you can use from cradle to grave, as they say. Um, and it would increase access to in-home and community-based services. Um, currently, uh, people who need long-term services and support under Medicaid, there is a bi institutional bias. Many people have to end up in institutional care when they would prefer to have home or community-based care, and that would that bias would end under this Medicare for All bill. And as um, as Uma said. Medicare for all is a is a money saver, absolutely. And uh, what we cannot afford is the status quo. That is what we have to always answer when we're asked, how will you pay for it? We can't afford what we're paying now. And all the economic models show overall health care savings in the trillions of dollars over, over, um, over 10 years. Um, but importantly for families, if for all but the very, very wealthiest Americans, this would be a, a a reduction in how much people are currently spending on health care. Um, the average family plan is $21,000 a year. And whether you are paying that you're out of your pocket, if you're lucky enough to have insurance through your employer, you are paying that in reduced wages. Absolutely, like that is what's happening currently. And so any increased payroll or income tax would be far less than what we're currently spending um, on health insurance premiums. Again, except for the very wealthiest and that's their turn to you know, pay their fair share. And, and that's why 200 plus economists have supported Medicare for all making the point that public financing for healthcare is not a matter of raising new money. It's just not, we're already spending this money. It's, re it's reducing healthcare outlays by individuals and it's distributing payments more equitably and efficiently across the system. And, um, and you know, it would, Medicare for all would, re would remove insurance companies from our health decisions. It would end rationing on ability to pay, which is what currently exists in our system. Our uh, the insurance company's business model is to collect more in premiums than they pay out in services so that they can deliver profits to their shareholders. So every incentive is to deny care. And this is, we take this profit out of the system and then you end rationing as it currently exists in the United States. We know the average US nurse spends 20 hours per week on paperwork. That's compared to two hours per week in Canada. Um, and much of that is about fighting insurance companies. I'm sure many of the nurses who are part of this would uh, of, of this call uh, have, have experiences uh, around this. Um, and we know that Medicare already is far more efficient than private insurance. Um, with only 2% overhead compared to 14% overhead, 14 to 17% overhead for private insurance companies. And remember, Medicare is providing healthcare to the portion of our population that consumes the most healthcare, and yet they are far more efficient than private insurance companies. And importantly, I think for, for um, states across the South, um, Medicare for All would be a lifeline for rural hospitals. Rural hospitals are closing now. Um, and they're closing because, and they're risk at closing, and it's actually gotten even worse during the pandemic. It would, um, because many hospitals are based, you know, there's so much uncompensated care when people who are uninsured 
have to go to emergency rooms, that has to be covered somewhere. It's draining resources from hospitals that serve low-income com communities. And um, global budgeting under Medicare for All would mean that you could actually give resources to hospitals to provide for the needs of the community instead of the income levels and the health insurance um, that, that those community members have. And finally, just really important to, I think to highlight again, racial inequity in our health system is, uh, is deadly. Uh, and the, um, by creating this Office of Health Equity, by directing research and resources to, um, to underserved populations, uh, this is a, a, a racial justice uh, absolute necessity. It is, will not get us all the way there. We have to still uh, dismantle racism in healthcare and racism in our society, but this is a, a critical, uh, important step forward. So just to mention, political momentum really is growing. You know, I mean, I think we had some questions, what was it going to mean with the Biden administration that, um, and, um, but however, we introduced this bill with more than half of the Democrats in the House, which was very exciting just off the bat. And importantly, we actually picked up new Democratic members from the from moderates that we had not signed on before. So we have 15 committee chairs now that have signed on, including the powerful chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee who had refused to sign on before, Frank Pallone from New Jersey. Very exciting. We also have seen um, Michael Quigley from Illinois, Tony Cardenas, who's also on that committee from California, hadn't signed on before. Um, Ted Deutsch from Florida hadn't signed on before. So we're, we have more momentum than we had previously, which I think is extremely exciting. And, um, and I think that that is because of all of the amazing organizing that's happened. I think that's also because COVID has changed the facts on the ground. Like there is no, if there was ever a question that our system was broken and we need Medicare for all, like that is thrown out the window. We know there's no question anymore. And, and so I think making that case to members of Congress is extremely important. Um, and we know that this policy is only getting more popular, um, and especially since COVID-19. So um, in North Carolina, Representative Alma Adams and Representative David Price have signed on to the bill. Thank you for all of your fantastic organizing. Um, and I know that there has been already a lot of work done to get to this point. So that's um, really important. Uh, obviously, we have a, a ways to go and there's a lot that we can do to, um, to build the movement to um, urge more and more co-sponsors of this bill. Um, so I just wanted to just really briefly before opening it to questions, just to say that one of the tactics we have used in addition to bird dogging, the district meetings, et cetera, is um, local resolutions. And I know that there has been an important, uh, there have been some efforts in North Carolina, Durham has passed a resolution. We've had other, um, places pass resolutions and I think there's some great movement happening in, in various places but that um, passing municipal resolutions has been a great way to build to build local coalitions and also to pressure uh, members who are sitting on the fence and, and it's really relevant in red blue and purple districts so it's been a great uh, way to do organizing um, and particularly because municipal governments right now, especially since COVID-19, are like having, their budgets are very strapped. And a lot of that has to do with increased health insurance premiums for, um, for municipal employees. That can be one of the highest budget line items for municipalities. So this has been um, uh, really rele relevant um, for local governments. So uh, this is something that we've been working on around the country. We have more than 300 efforts underway. Um, so many in North Carolina would love to get even more um, underway. And um, we have just since the pandemic, there's actually, this is a, even a little bit old. We have some more from uh, from New Jersey and also from Vermont that passed recently, California of resolutions that have passed all over this country. And actually since the, um, since the pandemic, we're seeing even more um, momentum on this. So we have a toolkit, happy to share um, in the chat if you haven't seen it, um, that uh, has, uh, uh, sorry, this slide is a little old. Um, <laughs> we have a, a webinar coming up in May, um, but we have a toolkit that, will, um, that walks you through it and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Melinda. Um, 
it did look like we had a few questions in the chat. Um, there's one question around if you could comment on the prohibitions in the in the bill. Um, someone was saying that um, there's a prohibition against an individual buying access to services through a private contract or insurance contract. And that same person commented that members of a local group supporting Medicare for all have asked if we know of any European countries that have a similar prohibition. Do you have- Wait, I'm looking, I'm kind of, I don't- It's up in the chat a little bit. It's like one at 153 is the timestamp, if that's helpful. Um, I'm sorry. A section summary that indicates there's a prohibition against individual buying access to services through a private contract or insurance contract. To be honest, I am not, I, I don't feel like I can comment on right, that right now. I will look into that and follow up with you. Robin. Okay, all right. Um, and then I'm gonna pass to Rebecca. I think she has a question for you as well. Thanks, I just wanna make sure Lauren's question um, gets asked. Um, she says, I'm still a little confused as to if and how going to a Medicare for all system will prevent the privatization of our hospital system. Um, uh, do we need a huge public infrastructure expenditure into the construction of mm -hmm. rural hospi hospitals and publicly paid doctors and nurses? Mm -hmm. No, no, that's a good question. You know, I think the way Medicare for all is structured, I mean, this is not a government run healthcare system like you have in the UK. The National Health Service is actually, uh, you know, doctors and nurses are employed by the British government. That is not what's contemplated um, in Medicare for all. It's more similar to this, um, to the Canadian system, which means that there's private delivery of healthcare, but public insurance. So that what um, and and so th this it does not address um, you, you know I but what I will say is that as I mentioned there are these global budgets for hospitals and then there's also special projects budgets that are de dedicated to investing resources in underserved communities so I think um, you know I. The other thing that it does do in terms of reining in just like the outrageous profit in our system that just bloats it is that it does not allow hospitals or you know our doctor's offices to use payments for profit. So so that means it like moves that this kind of bloated for-profit health uh, system into, actually uh, putting those dollars toward care. Um, and so, so, I mean, I think it would go a long way, um, but it would, not, it would not create public hospitals um, unless there were specific areas where it's absolutely needed. Uh, one of the questions is, can we get a copy of this PowerPoint? Absolutely. Okay, no thanks. Um, does HR 1976 expand the number of funded residency training positions? Um, I, as far as I am aware, I don't believe that that is included, um, but I can, I can look into that. Great. I have a question. You started this off by saying um, that Senator Sanders is going to hopefully be um, mm -hmm. putting forth his version of the bill. Is it going to be a true companion bill to the House bill in terms of being more similar than it was the last time around? So is there going to be improvements in that bill as well? And do you have an estimated time when that is going to be coming out? Um, great question. Uh, I um, so. As as far as we know, the the Senate bill will not be identical to the House bill, but we do understand that it will that they are. Representative Diapol's office has been in communication with with Senator Sanders' office. They they are aware of the changes. They are going to you know they're they're looking at what what are some of them that can be incorporated into their bill. As far as I understand, um, I think on the Senate side they have to be. Um, they are somewhat wary about making large changes because they don't 
want to lose any of their co-sponsors that they had from before. And so they're, uh, I mean, the way the movement as, as like our organization and some of our partner organizations have, um, have considered these is that these are, we consider them to be companion bills of obviously, you know, this is not something that is becoming law immediately. And so we see them as conferenceable, as you say, you know, like if they were to both pass, you could, you know, put them into a conference committee and, and, and work out the details. So, um, but I do know that like, for instance, the Half Office of Health Equity and some of those things that have been discussed are being discussed um, on the Senate side. So I'm not sure exactly, we haven't seen text yet. Um, so we'll see what they, um, what they um, manage to come up with. And in terms of timing, I mean, what's happened as folks probably know, Senator Sanders is the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. Um, and that is a really, um, that's, that's been a very busy position uh, because all of the, um, all of the bills that we're trying to get through through budget reconciliation. So that's the one way that legislative packages can go through without a filibuster um, in, in the Senate. And so um, basically that, that position, he's, been very, very occupied working through that. And so, you know, there was the COVID relief package and now there's discussions about these infrastructure packages as well. And that could potentially also go through budget reconciliation. So that's been, I mean, um, the fact that it hasn't been introduced is not a, a backing away of, uh, from a commitment. And we've talked to their office, they're very, you know, they're, they're very much on board with this, but this is, you know, in terms of kind of where they need to be putting their energy. So we expect, um, you know, we're hoping that it will be relatively soon, but again, these these timelines kind of keep slipping because there keeps being kind of more and more. And, and as folks may have heard, you know, the American Families Plan, which is the second part of the infrastructure bill that, or infrastructure plan that um, uh, President Biden has been talking about, there is a possibility of healthcare reforms to be in there as well. And so some of our champions are pushing uh, for that to, you know, to have drug price negotiation in there, to have, um, you know, improvements to Medicare, some of the things that we would like to see um, as stepping stones to get to a Medicare for all. So all of that is kind of swirling around the hill right now. So that's um, impacting um, the timeline. Thank you. Um, one more or two more questions. Uh, does HR 1976 include a provision for a function like the UK's NICE to help assure that products and services are evidence supported and of reasonable cost effectiveness? Once again, you you have some very very technical uh, <laughs> activists on your <laughs> on your call, and maybe maybe there's others of you on here who know the answer to that question, but I actually don't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and um, are you all uh, at Public Citizen helping at all to write the bills? It's another one. Um, so uh, we have. Um, so as you may guess from my lack of granular understanding of every uh, detail that I personally am not doing that. However, my colleague Egan Kemp is our health policy advocate. He spent 10 years at the Government Accountability Office and helped to implement the, or was very like working on the Affordable Care Act and you know knows, knows healthcare in, inside and out. And um, so he has been, um, part of a small group of, of advocates, including the nurses, including PNHP, including um, uh, Center for um, uh, Popular uh, Democracy, democracy. Um, that have been um, that have been closely consulting with Representative Jayapal and helping to draft uh, language for for the bills and and also Senator Sanders. Wonderful. Um, I think that's all we have time for, although there, there is one more about that, um, the expansion of the residency training positions, because that is an access issue, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of um, how, how many spots we have for people to go to the doctor in terms of waiting, wait lists and stuff. So is there, how can we lobby for the Senate version of the bill to include something like that? Um, no, I mean, those, I think those are important, um, important points. I think, you know, definitely there are, we are having conversations with this, with the Senate side, as I mentioned, I, we don't expect there to be like vast 
changes um, to, to that bill. And at this point, I mean, we really see this as like, we need to build a political movement before we're able to kind of get to that level of granularity uh, around these things. I mean, it's, it's critically important for us to be talking about them. And, and, and I will say also, um, the other important thing, in addition to getting co-sponsors, is that we need to get hearings on these bills, um, and that the hearings are the opportunity to raise some of the, you know, some of the policy questions that are being raised, just to make sure that we get, you know, that it, it builds the legislative record. And so we we got a commitment for the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is exciting to have a hearing, and we're expecting others. And we hope Senator Sanders, you know, in his uh, chair. Manship will also be able to get some hearings on the Senate side, which I think will be really important. Um, so, you know, so I think that there, there are opportunities to continue to have these conversations. And, you know, we, once we build this movement, then we were, you know, we'll need to be advocating for all of the important um, uh, details that we are, um, that we're talking about here. Um, I see, Robin, that you asked about the text of the bill. It is published and available, so I can, I can drop a link to the, um, to the text. I put, um, I put it, I put it in. It's okay. on, yeah, because it's not mm -hmm. on the, the bill.gov, but it's on Jayapal's site. Um, yeah. I just found that out because. Yep, yep, that's right. Yeah. It, it is on her site, exactly. Right, yes. Um, um, so, so yeah. thank you, Melinda. I also want to personally thank you for giving us the uh, template for our resolutions. Uh, someone put in the chat, it passed in Chatham County. We also passed it in Orange, in Wake, in Granville, in Wayne, um, in Cumberland. Um, so we are going to fight uh, as it moves up to get a better platform position um, on the state level than mm -hmm. is currently in there right now. So thank you so much. And thanks for mm -hmm. um, presenting all this great information about the new bill. It's super exciting. Uh, the changes sound amazing. And uh, we are looking forward to trying to do everything in our power to have more co-sponsors, the hearings, and then eventually get this policy. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.